Good morning. Welcome to St. Matthew's. Whether you're joining us here on this gorgeous day or joining us on Facebook and may, or maybe joining us later in the week, we're really, really happy that you're here. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. So let's worship. Morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you and also with you. How, how long can we sleep? We hear the Lord calling us. How long can we fear the future? We hear the Lord calling us. Please join me in the opening prayer. Our Lord, our God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right persevering and steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. We ask and believe, amen. The opening hymn is Stand Up for Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for coming today. So glad to see it. We're, we're kind of uh, on the right side today. I don't know why, but we could fill in some on the left. That would be okay. There's no political statement here. This is just the way people happen to sit, but we're so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're joining us online. We got a lot going on in the church today. Um, let's just go ahead and look at some of these slides together. Uh, we had a challenge last week about which city was going to rock the Super Bowl. Was it going to be L.A. or Cincinnati? And uh, I want to tell you that in our own church, not only do we collect over 100 cans of 
soup and other groceries that we were able uh, to get out there. But we raised uh, just shy of 1000 by Monday morning, but we are now the grand total. How about this? $6,000 we raised just in our church. So that puts us, I'm making the number up, but it's like we're over $100,000 as L.A., uh, to feed the hungry, that our Super Bowl results was that we rocked, and we won the Super Bowl, too. So there you go, Rams. But more important, we were able to take care of a lot of people on that Sunday by, you know, actually reaching out. A lot of the community uh, uh, groups, and MANA is one of our largest food banks and, and suppliers of hope and also suppliers of food items, they um, were ready to receive our check and were there. I got a chance to meet the director and the director of operations. And uh, we had made a commitment to go back and help them move into their new location. If you don't know, they bought a church in Thousand Oaks and they're, and they're building onto it and they're relocating from that small house all the way out um, you know, down the street, like three blocks is all they're going. But they'll have about four times the space and the ability to serve the community. So right on, Mana. I hope that you're watching this morning. Thank you for all your service on our behalf. Also, um, we have one more thing about our cooperative family ministry, uh, Caneo Connect. We are going to go forward with this. We're going to meet for the first uh, Wednesday night in March here for Ash Wednesday service. And all three of the, the churches are going to be together. So Thousand Oaks is going to come join us. Westlake Village is coming over to join us. We're going to have imposition of ashes uh, in the parking lot from 5 to 6. And then we're going to have a service in here at 6.30. And we want to invite you to come and be a part of that. Um, and then the following Wednesdays, five Wednesdays after that, we'll be having our whole family ministry here on Wednesday night. We're going to start out with dinner on the patio, uh, weather permitting. Uh, pizza permitting, uh, you know, you can eat pizza anywhere. So we're going to have pizza there or in our cars. I'm not sure where, but we're going to have pizza together. And then we're going to move into adults and youth and children. And then at the end, we end with everybody together and the kids get to lead us. So it's going to be a great time for us to gather together. We've been working a long time on this curriculum and we're going to be the first host church. So we got a few things we got to take care of. We're going to try to do, if we can, we'll do dinner here in the sanctuary, round tables and chairs, and have our worship together. But if not, we'll be on the patio. We need some people to help coordinate. And then the whole team will stay after to put things away, to get it back in shape for Sunday morning. So that's starting in March, and I hope you can be a part of it. So uh, anything else that's going to be happening, we'll talk about later uh, in the life of the church and after church. So... I'm really excited to have our children's time today be supplied by our youth who have come here. And I see, yeah, you guys are all in the house. Whoop, whoop. So come on up here. And there's a mic. Um, there's a couple of mics around here. There's one right there that Lynn's got. And whoever's speaking first, use that. That'd be great. You don't think it's on? All right. Well, if it's not, we've got others that are. Check two. Well, maybe. There you go. There you go. All right. There you go. Okay. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, we went to winter camp last weekend. Um, that's us on the way there. It was really fun. Um, my favorite part of it was the um, singing the worship music with the band. That was really cool. Um, also, just spending time with everyone was just really fun. Uh, my favorite part was we had a late night dance party with glow sticks, and that was a lot of fun. And we got to spend some time with like other campers that were there too. Um, my favorite part was the morning worship, early in the morning, and like all the cabin time that we had. My favorite part was just hanging out with all of my friends, and also the weather was super nice. My favorite part was the milkshake backup. <laughs> um, so basically, we were coming back and we were uh, getting milkshakes, but the guy who was making them just had like 20 in a row and would just didn't give them out until he was done with all the orders. So by the time we got them, it was just soupy. And that was, that was really fun. I have a picture. 
That's great. All right. That's good. And I have questions. I have questions. Okay. So you asked me a lot of questions in the puppet time, so it's my turn. All right? So I heard food. I heard fellowship. I heard good weather. Um, and music, right? But uh, don't, don't help them now. Okay. So what, what part of this uh, helped you? What did you do at camp that helped you learn something about yourself? <laughs> did you do anything that you go oh I didn't know I could do that or oh I've done that before but it meant something to you at this time yeah. we had solo time um, on Saturday yeah. and it was about like 30 minutes that we could just spend like with ourselves and with God mm -hmm. um, and it was after kind of like the message that Miss Speaker had shared with us okay mm -hmm. alright cool alright Anybody else? Then what did you learn about God? If you didn't learn anything about yourself, then what, what was your, what was, was there an aha moment on the weekend about the Lord, about anything about God? <laughs> Creation, beautiful mountains. We're going to have to go back to camp. I can see that right there. <laughs> no, I don't mean to be mean, but yeah. I'd like to point out that the guy who, the guy that was speaking didn't really speak that much about God. He just like did these demonstrations and talked about his son a lot. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and then there was, and then he, like on the first night he brought this, he brought this, uh, like he brought them things from his son's birthday party. It was like Star Wars themed. And there's this, he broke this like um, nightlight. And then on the second night he like took like a, like all of the stuff out of this wallet and just pushed it to the side. And it was really weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, did, I didn't really learn that much because he mostly just did demonstrations oh, um, okay. with people from the crowd. Okay. Oh, and then there's this one guy on the day we were leaving. Yeah. Um, so it was about this story and then there's this guy so I think was just with the stick, that, or the, the thing that he just held up and there's a demonstration from a kid in the uh, crowd, uh -huh. and he was <laughs> holding a broom, and he got sent to the back, and then he was just holding it up, and then he just started doing squats, and he was like in front of us. <laughs> oh, and great. That was, a, that was a pretty Chad move. I, I think that was supposed to teach us that we should accept help from others, but he wasn't. It was a Chad people. move, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> so did you learn to love the people that were up there doing their thing? Did you feel like you were connected to people up there, community? And that God was in the midst of all that? Yeah. Let's say yes. <laughs> anyway, all right, there you go, there you go. Woo! Thank you. Okay, anything else? Oh, yeah, yeah. I asked them if they were glad they went. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, great, okay. We're glad that you went too, so, all right. Thank you, thank you, all right. Cool. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> the scripture today is from Galatians chapter 1 verses 11 to 24. I want you to know brothers and sisters that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous ways of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God set, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. 
Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Christy. Thank you. So we were going to have a trio up here singing today, but it became a solo. I'm not sure how that happened, but, <laughs> but it's not going to be solo. You're going to join me. We're going to sing Blessed Assurance together. And when we get to the end of it, there's this part where we go off and do a new bridge. And then we're going to come back to the chorus again. So if you are able to rise, would you stand up and sing with us this morning? Here we go. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. A little pause. We're of salvation, purchase of God. of his spirit washed of his blood this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story my song, praising my Savior all the day long. From the mission, all is at rest. I and my Savior happy and blessed, watching and waiting, mercy of God, love is this goodness, and lost in his love. All right, let's sing out. This is my story, this is my song. In my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. My King is coming soon. He will roll the clouds away, the light of heaven through. Oh, what a glorious day. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. That's it. You can sit down.
<laughs> Unless we want to do it again. Thank you, Kevin, too, because he always adds something to these pieces. We're grateful, very grateful. So the question I was uh, thinking about us to consider today was, well, actually, I changed it four times. Um, because at first I was going to just talk about getting over ourselves. I actually preached a sermon a number of years ago, and that was the title of it, Get Over Yourself. Because it just seemed like everybody that was coming to church had a long list of things they were complaining about. They didn't like this, they didn't like that. One woman said, I used to have a parking space next to the church before all those people showed up. <laughs> I said, uh, that's probably a good thing. But if you feel like you paid for your parking space, we can certainly put a sign out there. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that. But I said, well, you could get here a little earlier. But the choir's in the way. So I know. So I finally said, I, I don't know what to do. I can't help you. And she said, oh, oh, I'll just get over myself. And into the church she marched. And I thought, that's the perfect sermon title. That will preach. Get over ourselves. Because doesn't it seem like COVID has done one thing? It, it's kind of got us so focused on, our, on ourselves, on where we are, what we're doing, who we can touch, who we can't touch. But, but from our perspective, it's like, man, I just wish I was free to go do like I used to do. Or I could go up to a friend, give him a big hug, or go, not go back to my car for the 27th time to get a mask because I forgot that I had to have one, right? Right? How many are doing that parking lot thing, right? You just go out there. If you, if you are lacking entertainment, go to Target and just sit there and watch the people come halfway to the store and go back. But I know that that's kind of a harsh way. I changed the sermon title to Get Over It, a little harsh, to, well, let's wake up from our coma. And then I thought, okay, that's kind of serious because we've had some people, even in our own church, that have been close to or, or been in uh, medical induced comas, you know, there, that's not a good thing to think about. And I thought, okay, back off from that. So then I renamed it again in my own mind this morning. About five o'clock, I said, well, what comes after the pandemic? Because really, that's the message. What's next for the church? What's next for us as Christians in this world? And that led me to thinking about the great awakening. So let me ask you this question. If somebody said, define the word awakening, how would you define it? Open subject. Awakening. Not waking up, but awakening. What, what do you think? Fully understanding. Fully understanding something. Yeah, I think they call that now woke. <laughs> like it already happened, but yeah, okay. Understanding, deeper understanding. Awareness. An awakening becomes an awareness. Okay? Yeah? Anybody on Facebook? We're delaying because, you know, there's a five-second delay there. But 15. Okay. A 15-second delay. All right. When they are awakened, you guys can, can, can lead it here. What does it mean to be awakened? Yes. Enlightened. Oh, perfect. Perfect segue. So there have been, according to historians, three major, there's actually four, but three major great awakenings in the world, in the world history. If you are, you know, a history buff or, his, you know, you like historical stuff, um, you go back all the way to the 1700s. In the 1730s and 1740s, in Europe, mostly in England, they had what was called the Great Awakening because right before that, Pam, was this age of enlightenment where becoming intellectually, mentally aware of something, learning something more about something, advances in medicine, advances in, in science in terms of the atmosphere, the weather patterns, uh, you know, the, we, we had telescopes, we were starting to look deeper into space. We had this age of enlightenment from the 16 to 1700s, but it really came to fruition about the early 1700s. And then about 1730, the Christian church was waking up to the fact that people were so interested in technology and intellectual 
um, exercises, but they completely forgot about their faith. It's the churches were emptying out, or the churches started to fill up with folks who wanted to talk about, you know, creationism versus this whole idea of, a, of, a, of an evolutionary kind of beginning. Yes, the, the argument started long, long, long time ago. And what happened in that, this awakening, was that the church got active. In fact, the church got over itself and got outside of itself. So an amazing thing happened. What used to be illegal, literally illegal in London and in, in, in England, in the Church of England, and the Anglican Church, you could not preach outdoors. You couldn't stand in a courtyard somewhere and preach outdoors. You were considered illegal, a rebel, a, a non liturgical pastor if you actually preached somewhere else than behind a pulpit or, or behind your degree, uh, some sort of vetting by the church where people could watch you, keep an eye on you, listen to your sermons, correct you when you're wrong. See, the age of enlightenment started to come in to the sermons as well. There was this kind of preaching stagnation because pastors couldn't state something about the beginning of time or the end of time. They couldn't talk about revelation or evolution or evolution. There wasn't this, this, this kind of progression that was happening. So that was the first of the great awakenings. And that's really where John and Charles Wesley got started during this 1940s. This is, I'm sorry, 1740s. They moved into a time in which they were starting to, to move outside of the church. But they said there's a methodology to being a Christian it's not an intellectual approach, but it's studying scripture. It's also spending time in prayer. It's also serving other people, and it's also taking time to take care of yourself. We're going to talk a lot about that next week. They talked about justification and sanctification. But by the time the 1790s rolled around, there was another great awakening in the New World, and it happened in New England, not England. And it happened in the first of the colonies that were primarily in the north. They were, they were more out of the Presbyterian or the Baptists. They, the denominations were starting to, to roll down through the 13 colonies. And as it just so happens, Charles and, and, uh, and John Wesley, our founders, you know, they came into Savannah, Georgia. So they didn't start from the north. They started from the south. And so that we had this kind of conversion um, from the, the people that they were preaching to in the South were common folks. They were, they were folks that were farmers and fishermen and, and, and people that were just getting by, just surviving the winters. And of course, winters in the South are a little different than the ones in the North, but there wasn't quite enough food and they were preaching and teaching to the Native Americans. And the idea was to be more of a missionary. Well, the third great awakening in the United States. At that time, we weren't the United States, but by the 1850s, we were figuring some of this out in the early, all the way into the early 1900s was the third great awakening. And new denominations were being formed. Disciples of Christ, an assembly of God, church of God, church of Christ. There's all these things started to happen, this rolling out generation after generation. There became something new. There was that third great awakening that brought us into right around 1900 on the West Coast. You know, everything started in the East and made itself West. And the West Coast, we used to have what were called arbor meetings or tent meetings. They were in August and they were traditionally at the end of the harvest. Well, at that time, California was primarily citrus. We had our own crops. I mean, we were, we were producing more food than uh, we had people. We, we had uh, so much export going out of California. And up the coast, if you drive up to Arroyo Grande and you get off there, instead of going to the ice cream shop in downtown off of Main Street, you turn left and you go up the hill to Camp Arroyo Grande. That was an arbor camp. That was an August camp meeting. And they built a tabernacle, this huge tent where they would gather in August, and then they started meeting year-round, and then they made it a permanent building. If you go there today, even though it's not belong, it doesn't belong to the United Methodist Church anymore, it's a camp, but you'll find a permanent tabernacle there. It's a round building, and uh, it was built right at that time, about 1915, when we started to organize these. That was our problem. We organized these camp meetings. We got them organized where there were milkshake shops inside, and there was there was stuff going on in the camp and people would come and enjoy themselves, but they didn't really have that kind of fervor or that kind of, you know, they didn't have those sort of 
uh, song fests that led to people making a decision for Christ. It was part of that whole idea. This is where our, our circuit riders started up in the United States. We didn't have enough pastors to go around to every place that was worshiping. So they would come around once a month, but the lay people would take care of the, the church or the property until the pastor could come back. This is, this is part of our history. Great awakenings. I have one more I want to add to this. Now, this is the most debated one. It was in the 19, late 60s, early 70s, and it was called the Jesus Movement. You remember this? Some of you were around for this. I am a child of the Jesus Movement which means that I had a bumper sticker on my Chevy Vega that read, turn or burn. Isn't that loving? I had it on the other bumper, Jesus is the answer. Remember that one? There was all kinds of stuff I used to do. As a teenager, I was so excited about my faith, and I would go to Calvary on Wednesday nights because that's where the concert was. And all the girls went there too. And then I was on Sundays at the Methodist church across the street going to youth group. I was getting some theology in the Methodist church. I was getting a whole lot of fun at Calvary. But Calvary said, if you're really going to be a Christian, you're going to take these tracks. And you're going to go to grocery stores. And you're going to throw them in people's baskets. And you're going to yell at them and say, Jesus loves you! And scare people to death. And eggs were broken. And folks would leave the store. And they would say things to the manager like, if you're going to let those teenagers in here, I'm never coming back. I mean, this was a serious deal. The Jesus movement unleashed a lot of people out there. And what we were trying to do is get everybody ready for something called the rapture because it was coming. And there was a man who wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And he had predicted that Jesus was going to return and all those who were faithful were going to be sucked up in a giant vacuum cleaner and taken off into heaven. And in doing so, that was supposed to happen in 1978. Well, 1978 came and I was 18 years old and I was still carrying tracks around and I was still a little confused between what the Methodist church was teaching, which was love all people and let God do all that work about eternity and the Calvary Church was teaching us, you've got to go out and you've got to get people because the world's about to end. And I'm, 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 I'm really confused about this. And my parents, who didn't go to church at all, were saying, oh my gosh, you should stop going to one of those churches because you're a mess, basically. <laughs> and I was a legal mess because I was now 18 years old. But you know what happened was Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, that, that predicted all of this I'm out of here stuff. Well, that day came, and we were all still there. So he rewrote it again, and he rewrote it again. And he rewrote his prognostication of the end of the world many different times. Oral Roberts did the same thing. You might remember that? Oral Roberts said, if I don't receive X amount of dollars by the end of the next weekend, because he was, he was $10 million in the hole. So he said, if you cannot bring that money in, the Lord is going to end it, and the rapture is going to come, and we're all going to be out of here. Well, he didn't get his $10 million by Monday, and the Lord did not take us away. And he went back and apologized because he said, I had a moment, a momentary lapse. Now, I'm not picking on the idea that the Lord is coming someday. I believe that all things are going to fall under the Lordship of Christ someday. But in terms of us scaring people into a faith, this is not an awakening. A great awakening is where we start to take ourselves, our own lives, and we look at whether or not we're faithfully walking in the footsteps of the apostles. And that brings us to our scripture. So Paul is having this amazing journey where he's worked himself up in Judaism to be a very well-paid teacher, uh, a Pharisee. He was legally a lawyer within the church. And he had made his claim to be such a great lawyer that he became a leader in Judaism, and he was a Roman citizen, and he was a member of Judaism royalty. So he had both cards in his back pocket. And whenever he was arrested by Jewish soldiers, he would pull out one card and say, but look, I'm a Pharisee. And they'd say, oh, please, come on in. 
And if he got arrested by the Roman soldiers, he'd pull out his Roman citizenship card and he'd say, well, see, I'm a Roman citizen. So this is how Paul was not killed many different times as he preached the gospel. But what you need to know is, Paul, who was Saul, was the instigator behind the majority of Christians being arrested and many of them being put to death. Do you remember Stephen, the first martyr? Now, if you look back at that story, you're going to find that there was somebody standing there who was holding the coats of the people who were stoning Stephen to death. A horrible way to die. Small stones to begin with, just to impale harm on somebody, but then larger ones later to crush them. And this is how Stephen died, and he held the jackets for the people that were wailing stones at the first martyr of Christendom. He was paid to infiltrate groups and then find out who the Christians were and then haul them off to Damascus or to some place where the Romans would take care of of these insubordinators. Here's the thing. Paul didn't have any, any credentials at all at being a word of God for the people of God. He had no credentials. In fact, he was hated by most of the Christian community. He was feared by the apostles who were now in Jerusalem after Jesus' death and resurrection. In about 33 to 35 AD, we're not sure exactly when, Paul was on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus to go get permission slips from the leaders to go out and find more Christians. In other words, to get paid more money to go do what he was so good at. And on that road to Damascus, that's when he was struck by what I would consider a bolt of lightning. But a light from heaven shot down and knocked him to the ground. And Jesus spoke to him directly. This is the only conversion story we have of Jesus speaking directly to a person. And it happened to be Saul. And he said, Lord, who, who are you? Oh, God. No, like he had this recognition that somebody holy was in his presence And Jesus said, it is Jesus. And why are you persecuting me? Well, that's a pretty darn good awakening if I would have one, right? I mean, you're knocked to the ground by a flash of light by God, and now you're being spoken to by Jesus himself. What would Jesus do? Well, right then, Jesus would ask you some pretty darn important questions. Why are you persecuting me? And Paul didn't have a good answer. So he said, I want you to go to Damascus. I want you to go there, and I want you to stay there, and somebody's going to come and tell you what to do. For the first time in his life, he had no control over what was happening. He was struck blind. He couldn't physically see. He had to make his way into that town with his companion, who apparently saw something happen and wasn't sure what it was, but probably was really glad it wasn't him on the ground talking to Jesus. And as you know later... uh, person that God sends to Paul and tells him the whole thing. He says, look, Paul, you're going to have to confess your sins. You're going to have to, your name is now Paul, it's not Saul. All that money that you used to have, all that power you used to have, you are working for somebody else now. Talk about a great awakening. In fact, Paul, spiritually, physically, and basically career-wise, was dead. Whatever he was doing, would no longer be done. So we come to this passage, and as he's writing to the church of Galatians, and he's saying, I have no credibility other than to tell you this. I have been given the gospel. What I preached to you came from God, not from me. I didn't make this up. He says that I went and visited Jerusalem. I tried to go talk to the apostles themselves, I spent 15 days with Cephas. Now, the, that, that word, by the way, is, is uh, the Latin text of it. But if you translate that in Aramaic, that's Peter. That's what Jesus called him. So he spent 15 days with Peter. We're not sure exactly how those 15 days went. We don't know exactly what happened. It wasn't that Peter was convincing Paul that he was now a follower of Jesus Christ. But he wanted to go and establish himself with the apostles, the, the, the 12 that now became more like 1,200. But there was a group of people that were supposed to be starting the church, and Paul was saying, 
well, I, I, I'm not quite that kind of apostle. I feel like I'm a missionary. I feel like God has called me out of my coma to go do something in the rest of the world. While you all are focusing on Jews, I'm going to focus on Gentiles. And you see, Peter and Paul did not exactly agree on this idea. Peter was convinced that you had to become a good Jew before you could become a Christian. You had to earn your stripes. You had to pay for that parking space before you ever got to park in it. And then you weren't going to park in it the rest of your life. If your church was healthy, you'd never get the space closest to the building. This is what was going on here in the early church. And the beauty of it is this. In the mission and ministry of Paul, the church actually started. He went to Gentiles. He said, and this is a self-confession, he went into a place of the world that he never thought that the word of God would have any power at all. That was Arabia. Now today, the Arab, you know, Arabian people or Middle Eastern, that would be somewhere around Babylon, which was Babylonia in those days. It's someplace in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, maybe parts of further east if you went to Kuwait and some of these other areas. But this is where he ended up being. This is where he lived and breathed and taught. And then he did his missionary journeys throughout the other parts. He went west from there. He took Barnabas with him and he went out and he did this kind of first round to get the churches started. He did talk to Jews, but he was preaching to the Gentiles. And all of a sudden churches were starting out of the synagogues and the church was taking away taking life and, and it was happening there because he needed the opportunity to do something new. And my question comes back to this. What are we going to do now that we are starting to reach herd immunity when no longer we have the restrictions of being together? Who is going to be with us? How many people are going to be here on a Sunday? Not everybody is going to come back to church. And you know what? We're going to continue to do live streaming of worship services from now until the Lord comes in that whatever you want to call it. And I don't think there's a giant vacuum cleaner that's going to selectively pick out just a certain people. But I do believe that in Christ's return, we will be held accountable to a couple of key questions. What did you do with the life that I gave you? Did you love the people that I put in your path? Were you a church that really cared about everybody that came? Were you willing to take those extraordinary steps, not only to give up your parking space, but to give up your bandwidth and to be in people's lives, in their homes, in their living rooms, in their, I don't know, some of you are probably watching from bed right now. I can't see you, but I'm just guessing <laughs> that you just put an extra pillow behind you, grabbed your iPad, and there you sit. I'm going to get a letter about that one. But at any rate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To get up and go, yeah, that's our great commission. But what I would call a COVID com a coma, it, it's, it's this idea that somehow we're being delayed in our ability to be the church. And truth is that the church has done more extraordinary things during these last two years than in the last 200 years. We have reached out to people in ways we never even imagined. Churches that had never put a screen in their church. I was in one yesterday at my, one of my closest friend's funeral. And, and that church has been there almost since the last Great Awakening. It was built right after the 19 teens and and so I'll talk about Nancy next week but but the I, I walked into this sanctuary that's it's 150 feet high in the middle it's it's all made of cement and it's this giant cathedral in downtown Glendale and as I walked in I thought finally this church has probably got monitors because they've refused to have monitors in their church all of these years well they went from little speakers to great big speakers. But there are no monitors that are permanent in the church. They roll them all out and then they all disappear like those new TVs that come up out of a cabinet and then sort of go away. So they're not quite to the place where they have the living banners in the church yet. 
But from that kind of high church experience where the organ is still played and everybody sits through the postlude, all the way to, you know, a church that's wide open to nature and we got screens and we'll try what's next. You know, you were so far ahead of what was going to happen to the church here at Newberry Park, here at St. Matthew's. You were willing to do what it took in order to be the family of God together. And that's good on you. I was watching. Seven years ago, I was watching you. I wasn't watching you online yet because you weren't there. But I was looking at pictures that were being posted. I was talking to your pastor about what's next. I was so encouraged by the courage of this congregation to step up and to step out. I didn't know that much about you as individuals, but I knew what your character was as a congregation. It might have been why when I was ready to get done being what I was doing as a superintendent that, and the bishop said, well, where should, I, he picked out three very big churches for me. Churches that were huge cathedrals, churches that not only didn't have screens, they didn't know that guitars existed. <laughs> and I said, I, I appreciate that. Really, Bishop, I do. I, I appreciate the fact that you see me able to go and lead a large congregation. But I'm looking for a church that's ready to do what's next, not a church that's trying to preserve what used to be. So how do we wake up out of this? How do we get up out of bed in the morning knowing we've got a purpose? Even if you work from home, it's still a good idea to take a shower and put on some clothes, you know? The sales of shirts and blouses went up 300% in the first six months of COVID, and the sale of pants went down 30%. In fact, our bishop himself, it was in a meeting, and, I, and he's, got his, he's got his, you know, clergy collar. It's like this. It's kind of unsnapped. He could slip in a little thing, and he could look like a bishop any second. And he said, all right, we're going to take a break. It was a Zoom meeting. And I said, okay, great. And we're all thinking, you know, there's like 40 of us on the, on the call, on the line. And, and he says, yeah, well, we're going to take a break now, so you all turn off your cameras and your mics, and I'll see you back here. And he gave us the time, right? And and he forgot to turn his camera off. He turned his mic off. And the bishop jumped up, and there he is in his running shorts. And he goes running out of the room, and he runs back in and sits back down again. And everybody's laughing at him. <laughs> quietly. You, you laugh at bishops quietly. But he's going, what, what? He said, bishop, we, didn't, you, we thought when you said that you wore shorts to your meetings, you were just joking with but you actually do. And he says, all right, you threw down the gauntlet. Everybody on chat right now has to tell me what they're wearing. <laughs> that was the most fun Zoom meeting I've ever had. <laughs> what do we do next? We're being told by professional psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, therapists, school principals, teachers, pastors, key lay people, that our communities are dying of lack of community, lack of connection, and lack of purpose. We have young adults that are not just failing to launch, but they're afraid to go out the door to do life on their own. We have seniors that made it through COVID and can't wait to travel again, but they're not all going to go jump on a cruise ship. Okay, some of them are. <laughs> and they're sitting in the front row right here. But, but not everybody is going to be satisfied by vacationing better. They're going to be looking for something to do that's meaningful in their life. And if ever we have counted on information and communication to get us through COVID with more numbers, more channels, more bandwidth, more devices, we now have to look back at the issues of the heart. 
we have to really start asking ourselves, do we feel the presence of God? Is there a peace in our life? Are we able to turn off all of that that distracts us for moments in which we can find the peace of God with us? Have we picked up a Bible recently and really kind of read it for ourselves? Do we have a prayer life? Have we started acts of kindness, not COVID-related, but just, you know, caring for people around us? Yes, we can feed the hungry, and we need to. And we need to start addressing some of the needs of homelessness right here in Newberry Park. Like, like sometimes people can pretend like we have no homeless here. Well, we are part of a community that has been pretty well taken care of itself. And this church 20 years ago was taking care of this church, the, the community so well that you were known in the community. But as I've gone into Newberry Park and as I go to a restaurant or I go to a gas station or if I go to talk to people, most of the people that are working there don't live here. They drive in. And the other people that I ask, hey, have you, do you know about that church at the top of the hill? And you can guess which ones they're naming. But one woman said, you're the, you're the church that does quilting. <laughs> and, and you quilt to help people all around the world who have mobility issues. I said, yes, that's my church. What's next? You and I are going to go into this Lenten season asking ourselves some questions. That's what Lent's about. And I would just encourage you to stay with that one question for a while. What's next? And later we'll ask the question, are we courageous enough to do it? Amen? Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in prayer, please. Maybe, here we go. <laughs> Lord, we come before you asking questions, and they're good questions. What's next? What would you have us do? And we're reminded about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So I pray today that we open our hearts to hear the Holy Spirit, to awaken us as individuals and as a church so that we can move forward to do your will. As we pray for our congregation, we also lift up the, the Knollwood UMC and the Grace Korean UMC, and just we're grateful for the freedom to be worshiping all together, Lord and to know that there are other churches as well worshiping you today. We have praise. We're very, very happy and excited to announce that Kelly Chow has graduated from nursing school, and she's beginning her rounds. She's been invited to be in the ER, which attests to her hard work. And we hope that she takes your love to the patients she cares for. We have another praise that Sharon Brown's daughter, Kathy, earned her doctorate in psychology, and perhaps she will also be able to help those, Lord, in need. We lift up the family of Bruce as he passed away this week. We know he's come home to be with you, but we ask you to comfort the family as they miss him. We give praise that Kathy Martin was able to have her surgery, and we ask that you help her recover there's been a lot of pain, and there's, it's going to be a long road to heal, but we know you'll be beside her, Lord. We lift up Kevin's mother in the hospital as they run tests to try to figure out what's going on with her, and we pray that you surround her with your Holy Spirit and your peace, as well as Kevin and the rest of his family at this time. And I ask, Lord, that we take just a silent moment to pray for those on our hearts and those on our screen with continued prayers and needs. Let's 
So, Father, we give thanks for all that you've done and all that you will do. Will you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite you to give thanks and to consider your blessings that the Lord has given you and be just aware of our gratitude as we give our offerings to God. Heavenly Father, we ask that you accept these gifts, just a small portion of what you have given us, that you may bless them to go into the world to do what needs to be done for your people. Amen. Please stay standing as we sing our closing hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. the royal master leads against the doth bleed on then Christian soldiers on to victory hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise sisters lift your voices when your word of praise onward Christian soldiers marching us to war with the cross of Jesus going on before 
Crowns and thorns may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will I softened the sermon title. I forgot to take that one out, but that's okay. <laughs> but it's not about being a soldier. It's about being a person who is willing to commit for Christ. So let us do that today. In everybody we meet, in every place we go, may people look at us and, and understand that we believe in something that gives us peace, that they can have peace with us. Amen. 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 Good morning. Yay. Hey, I got a mic for you. Oh, what? I can't use this one? Oh, you can use any one you want. I'm good. All right. Hey, how many mics does one need? Hey, it's hey. so nice to see you people out of your coma. woo You know, I went, uh, Kent was slumped over in front of the TV or whatever, and mm -hmm. I said to him, this is so boring, and I turned it off, and he got really mad at me. He said, that's the trustees meeting. Knock it off. <laughs> I'm, I said it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Boo. I don't care. I said it, but I'm actually uh, really, really proud of this church and all the people in it that have worked so hard to keep our eye on the prize, right? We're here to worship together in community, so for all of you that come every week um, and work hard on the screen and setting up and preparing the sermon and playing the piano... And worship leader, I appreciate you guys so much because you keep this little boat moving forward, you know? And you 50 people, I will say, Pastor, none of them are in pajamas and slippers. Hey, you got dressed today. Good job. All right, so we got a lot going on in church. Check this out. What is this? Wesleyan Way to Missional Congregations. The last one. Hop on. Tuesday. Tuesday night. Okay. And Ash Wednesday is going to be a, dr a drive through <laughs> How cool is that? I know. I did it last year. It was really fun. Okay. drive through And the Cooperative Family Ministry is hosted here. You need some help with that, right? We do. We do. We need help. So uh, if you're thinking about that, the men's studies are Wednesdays at 11 a.m. on the patio and on Zoom. Yes, and Saturday in person at Denny's, because they will not Zoom you your bacon and eggs. All right, guys, ministry happenings, a book study, Strength to Love, on Thursday at 11 a.m. Journey out in February. We're almost done, right? 13th to the 27th, what's the date today? Next week. Oh, so what needs to happen? Tell me that. Okay, I'll say that for the people on Zoom. So next week, they'll be at church with a helping. Oh, this week. When you exit, grab a helping hand and help out. Now, if you want to help out and you're not here, you're on Zoom, contact Heather Knadler. No, don't. Contact Heather Knadler. Don't. Choose your thing online. There is a perfect pot left. There is no perfect potluck that does not have mashed potatoes, Heather Knadler. <laughs> Sorry. But yes, you can choose online. That works for us. Okay. Uh, support your Girl Scouts. It's cookie season. Contact Hannah, Katie, Abby, or Mika. And uh, are there birthday? Oh, Dr. Rich. I saw Dr. Rich in the house. Where are you, Dr. Rich? Hi, Dr. Rich. Thank you for the beautiful flowers. So nice of you to... Uh, they're gorgeous. And who's got birthdays today? <gasps> Jen Quo, Patty Beery, and Max Young. Are we going to sing? Oh, yeah. 
Let's do it. St. Matthew's Church family, welcome home. 